Hey, this is Jeremy from Preemptive Love Coalition. I'm in Iraq right now, but I'm thinking a lot about life back home in America, where I'm from. Thinking about these pipe bombs that have been sent to people from one political side right now, seemingly targeting political opponents, seemingly targeting people from, from one side, not the other side. And I'm thinking about the language and the rhetoric and all the energy and angst around this so-called migrant caravan, which I've just typically called moms and dads and kids and grandmas and grandpas on the run for their lives. Um, and there's a lot of punditry and a lot of talk and a lot of uh, words being spilt on this right now. And so I am a little hesitant, reticent to jump into the fray, but, but where I think Jess and I have something to offer here is that most of the punditry and most of the talking heads don't actually live in a country where things like this have had massive impact. So let's go with the pipe bombs. If, if you haven't lived through a suicide bombing, I'm going to be pretty slow to take your dismissive opinion or voice on what it's like and what it means to have these bombs being made and dropped off and targeting certain people and certain groups and certain sides. I'm just going to have a hard time taking you seriously because we have felt the blast of suicide bombs targeting this group or that group or this building that belongs to that political party or not that. And once you've lived under martial law, once you've lived under the, the fear that today could be your day, once you've, once you've learned to adjust your route that you travel so you don't go by those political buildings because those people might be targeted by the other people. Once you learn to read flags on, uh, on a, a lapel or a shoulder, trying to size up who's coming at you and who they might be aligned with, and are you on the right side or are they on the wrong side? If you haven't lived through that, maybe just sit down and absorb what's happening right now. Maybe, maybe don't choose to put the voice out there saying anything like, this is no big deal. It's a big deal. I don't care which side's being targeted, but there is one side being targeted right now. And, and that targeting is directly tied to language. Being used, directly tied to stories that are being told, directly tied to the, the dog whistle kind of politics and name calling and things like that that is, that is so rife and prominent right now. And, and chiefly promoted and perpetrated by the president. And I think this cannot be glossed over. I think this cannot be swept under the rug. The people receiving and being targeted by these bombs right now are being targeted by all obvious evidence in direct connection to the tone set at the top of our country. And, and so to flip-flop and to come back and forth on things like, we all need to come together, we all just need to get along, we all need to be civil, and then to turn around in a day or two, or to have just a day or two prior promoted the, the, the denigration of other people, to have celebrated the body slamming of journalists, to, to, to promote this kind of hate and name calling, it's not defensible. It's not supportable. It's not something that should be voted for and defended and, and approved in referenda. It, this is wrong. This way of living is wrong. This way of talking and being and rationalizing is wrong. This, this fist up, defensive, everyone's out to get me is wrong. And this, this swinging, fighting, I punch back harder than anyone is wrong.
we, we have the capacity to be better than this. I, I'm not going to say we are better than this. But we have the capacity to be better than this. And, and because Jess and I and our kids and our team here have lived through this, I don't see this as something worth trifling with. This is not something I can sweep under the rug. This is not something I can say, oh, it's just a couple of people, or they didn't detonate, they didn't go off, or it was just meant to scare someone, or this is where it starts. This is where it starts. And, and if any of us think that we, you and me, and our friends, and our family, and people we worship with and the people we go to school with and work with, if, if we think for one second that we are not capable of escalating this violence, that, that we are not capable of devolving into the kind of chaos that you gratefully have been giving of yourself, giving your life, giving your time and money to support us and, and our friends here in Iraq and Syria on, on this side of the world, if you think, if we think we're not capable of falling into these same traps, we got another thing coming. This is where it starts. It starts with a bomb here. It, it starts with a targeted killing there. It starts with the silencing and the, the oppression of people over here. It, it starts by making one side or one group feel so infuriated and so under threat and so without recourse that then they take up arms. And then because they've taken up arms, the other side takes up more arms. And because they did a tit, they do a tat. And back and forth and back and forth until you get a situation like Syria where each side is blaming the other side for what happened most recently, claiming that somehow that was ground zero, that, that that's where the justification for the next attack began. No one's even able to look back anymore and give an honest accounting of how entangled and how bloody hands on all sides have become. It's not where it started. Things started so simply. Things started so purely. But Syria has devolved into a, a chaotic mess of, of blood and guilt and war crimes and complicity on so many sides. And, and they are us, and I am them, and I have all the stuff in me, and respectfully, you have all the stuff in you to end up in the same place. And so I, I, I plead, I, I use this patch of ground that... I live on here in a country and in a region that has seen so much. I, I use it to just say, please, let's take this moment seriously. Let's not turn a blind eye. Let's not explain it away. There's, there's a lot of sadness and irony for me that, that so many friends have given so generously to support people on this side of the world who are running for their lives. There's a special irony for me that, that so many friends, generous, loving people have given to support Christians on this side of the world who are running from a group like ISIS. And yet today, in Mexico, there is a similar group of people fleeing for their lives. The only difference is they're not fleeing from a bunch of Muslims. And so even though they are Christians, even though they are moms and they are dads and they are kids, the same, the same stuff, the same humanity that we cried out for and said, that is, that's wrong that they would be oppressed in Iraq, that they would be oppressed in Syria. The same humanity for which we cried out and said, we must help them. 
those, those very same people, moms, brothers, sisters, dads, grandmas, kids, humans, and yes, Christians, for some of you that matters profoundly, are, are crying out to God, are crying out to governments, and are saying, we need to be set free, we need to be liberated, we need to have safe passage so that we can get to a place of protection. Why is it so different for us? Why did we, we protect the one and we're so afraid of the other? Islam seems to be, for some of us, the reason why. The reason why they are treated differently. So to just follow down this line, we, we actually don't seem to hold a consistent ethic of human life, even for what one might call fellow Christians. No, there, there's the Christians persecuted by Islam, by Muslims, by ISIS. They are the ones we really care about. But the Christians coming too close to us, crossing our borders to to take away our jobs and their rapists and their murderers and their gang members. No, these kinds of Christians, we, we don't see a fellow similar kind of humanity and vulnerability and likeness and, and kinship with them. No, they, they must be locked out. We must be protected. We are the vulnerable ones here. They are coming for us in our nice homes, in our suburbs, in our schools. Protect us. Protect ourselves, build up the walls and build up the fences and lock the doors and lock the gates. Keep them out so we can protect our Christianity. This is so messed up, so backwards, so wrong. Again, we have the capacity to be better than this. I just don't know if we will. Someone needs to get on a plane right now and go to Mexico. And, and join up with this group of friends, of moms, of dads, of grandmas, and kids. And, and I say friends not because they're necessarily intimately my friends today, but they will be. And they could be your friends. They should be our friends. Because there's, I know, there's no talking head punditry. There's no, none of, no matter how passionate and excited and intense I get, I know that this stuff rarely changes minds and hearts. I, I, I know that. I feel like I have to do it. But, but maybe what's needed more than anything is not that my words convince anyone of anything, except to raise our hands and say, I'll fly to Mexico. And, and I'll get in the mix with them. I'll get in the fray with them. And I'll, I'll walk with them. And I'll help carry their kids. I'll pull their luggage. And we'll, we'll come to that legal crossing point, port of entry together. I don't know Spanish, but I'll go do it with them. Because that's my brother. That's my sister. That's a fellow human marching that long road in search of safety. When I pledge allegiance to the flag, I, I, I was pledging allegiance for freedom. And I believe in a flag big enough that it can be stretched wide to give shelter to us all. I believe in a flag that's strong enough to withstand any, like, bigotry and jingoistic rhetoric about the outsider. We're all outsiders here. Except those who were here natively from the beginning and had their land stolen from them. Almost everyone else comes from the outside. Who wants to go to Mexico? Who wants to get in the fray? Who wants to mix it up and know this migrant caravan, this faceless horde, this, this, this marching mass, as they've been so terribly called, who wants to know them personally? Who wants to know them face to face? Who wants to know them as a friend? I can't, I can't leave what I'm doing at this minute. I, I have to hold the ground to which you've sent us the work that, that we're doing right now in this minute on this side of the world. But I can support you. 
at, at least individually and maybe organizationally. I can, I can be a coach. I can be a cheerleader. I can be a sounding board. There may be other support I can give or we can give. Who wants to go to Mexico? Who wants to get in a, in, a, in a plane or cross a border and go find and be with and among these friends? Who wants to know the story from the inside? Who wants to help us tell the story to those back home who are suspicious, who are scared, who, who rightly, rightly believe that our borders should matter, they should mean something, they should be safe? At the end of the day, our, our, our words, they matter because they have such a capacity to incite fear and tear down. And, and our words matter because they do have the capacity to paint a picture for the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. The challenge is that we have competing views that, that are at risk of clashing with one another about what the more beautiful world is, about what it means to have a, a future society. That's what we're not agreed upon. And I don't know if our words alone can, can get us to come together in agreement. What I think we need are relationships. What I, what I think we need are shared experiences. What I think we need is empathy. And that's, that's done face-to-face. That's not, it's not done through blog posts or, or me preaching at you. To that end, we're recruiting right now. We, we launched last year our frontline local chapters. We, we've got a pilot chapter going right now, where people from different walks of life come together in a living room to listen and learn and understand from each other. And then go out into the world to actually be friends in the community together, waging peace, wage peace on the front lines where, where we live. Frontline local chapters are, are about giving together and gathering together and going together. And we're recruiting right now because we need more of these frontline chapters all over the world. Because we really believe that that our our mediated communications are only going to do so much for us. What we need is to, we need to get offline. We need to get off our social media. We need to get off of our echo chambers and and get face-to-face and shoulder to shoulder and hand in hand with one another, going in the same direction, working toward the same things. So we're recruiting frontline local chapter leaders. If you want to see one of these frontline chapters in your town where you live, if you want to wage peace on the front lines where you live, if you want to help gather people from all walks of life so that we can listen and learn and understand each other better, I hope you'll apply. We'll put information in the link below. Preemptivelove.org slash chapters is where you can go to find out more. But we'd love for someone to raise their hand and say, I am interested in hearing more about becoming a frontline chapter leader because I want to wage peace where I live in the real world. I don't want to just write a check and send it to the other side of the world to help people who are suffering. I actually know that these conflicts before there are ever airstrikes and, and ISIS and pipe bombs in mailboxes, th- these wars started our, our heads and our hearts before they ever reach our hands. And so I want to be a part of that right where I live in my neighborhood. Preemptivelove.org slash chapters is where we would love to hear from you and see if we could get more of these chapters going right where you live. Change takes time, especially the positive change.
the, the negative change, that comes way too fast. That, that, that comes at us like a train. And that's what I'm, I'm desperately wanting with you to help stave off right now is the, the continued downward spiral of our rhetoric and our, our kindness toward one another and our open-handed hospitality toward one another. And I've been thinking about this, this change takes time thing, because we've, we've got a new prime minister in Iraq. And, and by some accounts, he really represents a, a shift, potentially represents a real stabilization of the country. Change takes time, and, and everyone wants to be cautious about over-narrating or over-analyzing this thing. But, but our new prime minister here is, is a friend that we've worked with for years. Back when he was vice president of Iraq, he was our number one supporter, go-to guy, advocate, when we were doing heart surgeries all over the country. Dr. Ada Abdomadi has hosted me in his home. I've had private meals with him and talked openly about country and, and the future. And, and he sponsored our work privately and through the government in, in really huge ways. And now we're, we're this many years on, eight years since we began our relationship, eight years since, since we met together initially, eight years, seven years, six years ago since we've, we've been working for this thing together, the, the future peace, the more beautiful Iraq that our hearts know is possible. And to see him named prime minister just reminds me that the change takes time. It reminds me the value and the importance of setting a long intention in the same direction and staying the course and being faithful and putting down deep roots and not being swayed off course. And so my invitation is let's, let's keep digging deep roots and setting our long intention on the front lines where we live on the front lines for Iraq, on the front lines for Syria, for Yemen, for North Korea, for your hometown in Texas or Ohio or California or Virginia or Florida. We have to go deep and we have to go long. Someone needs to get on a plane and go to Mexico. And I want to support that however I can. Somebody needs to raise their hand and say, I want to be a frontline chapter leader and wage peace with people from all walks of life right where I live. And maybe someone would raise their hand and say, I want to join the Frontline Monthly Giving community by, by pulling out my credit card and signing up to be a monthly sponsor. Because this work that we've been doing, like I just said, is years and years and years long. Those heart surgeries we provided with the, our now Prime Minister eight years ago, those kids are, are going to college. Those kids are married now. Those kids are having kids now that they are adults. Those of you who are, have been monthly sponsors for eight years plus, you set in motion things eight years ago that constituted the waging of peace, that, that constituted the building up of Iraqi institutions that now Dr. Abdel Abdelmadi, our prime minister, has has used, has campaigned on, has pointed to, to say, look at, look at what is possible when we all work together. You have had a hand in creating the Iraq that we have today through your monthly gifts, through your steady support for believing in a long vision and a long intention and deep roots headed in the same direction. So I just want to say thank you. It's a, it's a momentous thing to think about our friend and the years that we've gotten to work and the things that he's set in motion and, and all the potential and, and promise that is wrapped up in this thing. 
I doubt it'll be perfect. I doubt it'll be easy. I, I think it will continue to be a zigzag kind of future for a while. But, but coming out of war was always bound to be that. But I wanted to reflect with you for a minute on what you've made possible. Thank you for those who have been giving for a while. Thank you. For, for those who just started giving monthly, think about what you're setting in motion eight years from now. Wow. I just We go through this exercise with our staff and our friends and our team here. What is the Iraq you dream of? What's the Syria you dream of? What's the world you dream of a year from now, five years from now, 30 years from now? And what are we going to do together to get there? I know five years from now, I don't want to see a more divided America. I don't want to see this side pitted even more against that side. I don't want any dead bodies or injuries as the result of escalating rhetoric and, and political violence. I don't want to see our country devolve. I don't want to see friends locked out and locked in squalor because we couldn't figure out how to be both just and hospitable. I believe in us. I believe in this message that we've been giving our life to called preemptive love, that we can, we can give our lives away. We can jump forward to love others before they've done anything to, to bless us or benefit us or hurt us, harm us. I hope you'll raise your hand for one of these things, one of these great, amazing things that we have in front of us to do together. Let's figure out how to go befriend these friends who are making their way toward America right now. Let's, let's have more local chapters where we gather with people from all walks of life to listen and learn and serve. And if you can, if you would, if you believe in this vision, I wonder if you'd pull out your credit card and become a monthly sponsor. Help us do more of this work all over the world. We're so grateful for you. More to come. Bye-bye.